behind or go on the record the approach yes
All rise. All the jury's present and accounted for. All right, thank you, Mr. Bill. Please be seated. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. We're back on the record on case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Adol. This is the second day of introduction of evidence of the state's case in chief, although the state is here and present. Mr. Wood was conducting examination of a witness. Uh, Mr. Wood, is the state ready to proceed this morning? Yes, sir. Okay, well, all of you know the defense is present, along with counsel and the defendant. The court also notes the jurors are all properly seated and all 18 jurors have returned. The court's also confirmed that the jurors each completed their affirmation this morning regarding uh, not looking into the case during the break. And so we appreciate you following that admonishment as well. Um, one other matter I just wanted to bring up before we got started with additional evidence is the court's live streaming this hearing and this trial uh, there are, there is a, uh, I heard there were some complaints that the audio maybe wasn't coming through very well on that. I'd ask the attorneys if they could to talk right into the mics. Of course, that helps as well with our <coughs> court reporter making the record. In addition, the live stream comes directly through the court's official channel. That can be somewhat difficult to find if you go to the Idaho Supreme Court website. However, there is a website on Ada County uh, about this trial. And if you just Google the term Ada County Daybell trial, there's an easy link to find for the court's official live stream. And that's the most direct signal. So for those that are observing the trial online, if you're having any issues with audio or quality of the signal, perhaps you could uh, go to that direct signal, which is the best source of the live stream proceeding. So uh, with that, then we had Detective Hermosillo was on the stand yesterday, and I believe he was continuing with direct examination. Is that correct, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. All right, I'll have the witness recalled then if you're ready to proceed with additional testimony. Thank you.
right. Uh, Detective Colonel Seal was sworn in yesterday. I'll remind you, you are still under oath for your testimony today. And to confirm, uh, not being the state's case agent, I just want to confirm that you didn't uh, review any, well, you had the first witness, so we don't need to do that on this particular witness. So, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to just inquire on further direct, you can do that at this time. All right, thank you. Good morning, Detective. Thank you. Detective, when we finished off yesterday, we were discussing what you had found or what you had observed at a burial site. And just for purposes of the jury, uh, what what site were you at uh, when you found the body you were speaking of yesterday? We were at uh, the site that we deemed JJ's burial site. And and where your honor if I could be given states to the ten eight. And if I may publish that. Yes, it's admitted, correct? Yes. So Detective, if you could, for reason, just for purposes of clarification, with a pointer, point out uh, the location you were speaking of. It's the burial site on the other side of this pond, just underneath this tree. Okay. Now, you call it a pond when you were out there on June 9th. Was there water in it? No, there wasn't. Okay. And and again, just to clarify, at, at, when we had left off your testimony yesterday, is it correct that you had, that you, what you observed was uh, what appeared to be a small body wrapped up in a black plastic bag? That's correct. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed. States exhibits 10B. Through 10 M. Detective, can you review those exhibits and let me know when you've got a chance to?
that the G-Rectal states exhibit can be equal to NM? Yes. What do they purport to be? Photographs, there's a photograph of the west side of the dependent Davos residence. Um, photographs of the backyard. Um, well, do you know when these photographs were taken? On June 9th, 2020. Were you the photographer? No. But you were on the property that day? That is correct. And were you able to observe each of the areas that are photographed in these exhibits? Yes. You saw them with, them with your own eyes? Yes, sir. And are these true and accurate representations of what you observed on June 9th, 2020? Yes. Your Honor, I've moved for admission of state's exhibits 10B through 10M. Any objection? Judge, just to into the microphone, please, Mr. Driver. I'm sorry, Judge. Judge, just one here on 10B, if I could. Otherwise, I'm fine with the rest of the exhibits. Okay, so let's um, do that then. So 10C through 10M have been offered or admitted in this priority in Bordera and 10B. And officer, you're looking at uh, 10B, is that right? Yes. Right now. <laughs> yes. And the vehicle that's parked in 10B, is that the vehicle that was uh, uh, the position of the vehicle at the time that uh, you testified about Mr. Daybell? That's not the vehicle that Mr. Daybell was in. No. Okay. Do you know what vehicle that is? In the driveway looks like a Subaru. Okay. Is that the driveway that, the, that you're making reference to? That's correct. So in other words, uh, Somebody else's vehicle is there. We don't know whose vehicle that is. It's not the one that Mr. Davo was in. But you don't know whose vehicle that is. I don't know whose vehicle that is. You don't know when the vehicle was put there. No, sir. You don't know who the owner of the vehicle is. That's correct. I would object, Judge, on foundation. All right, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Detective, so you don't know who, whose vehicle that is, correct? Correct. But you were still there that day. Okay. Can you, do you recognize this as Mr. Daybell's residence? Yes, I do. And this is a true and accurate representation of Mr. Daybell's residence? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I think significant or sufficient foundation has been laid. All right, Judge, I just make a record that I'm objecting also on the basis of relevance. It looks like it's a picture of a vehicle in the driveway. Okay, well, the picture shows many things, including a vehicle. I'll allow the state to have this admitted and Sufficient foundation has been established, so 10B is admitted as well as the others. Thank you. Detective, if you will, or Your Honor, may I publish? Yes. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10B? That is the west side of the Daybell residence. When I testified earlier to coming out and standing in the lawn area, um, that's not the vehicle that Mr. Daybell was in, but it was similarly parked that way back in. And that's the driveway he was sitting in when I was observing him. Look over his right shoulder toward the pond area. Detective, do you have that the pond with you? Can you point to where you were standing when you initially observed Mr. Daybell's behavior? I was standing here in this area. And then you you said that you could you positioned yourself so that you could see what you thought he was looking at. That's correct. And where did you go then? I stood more towards the driveway area. The vehicle that Mr. Daybell was in was up further this way. It wasn't back in as far as this vehicle in the photograph. All right. And just to clarify, is that when you looked back and saw the activity under what became the first burial site? Well, I was looking forward at that time. I was facing this direction. 
and I aligned myself with Mr. Daybell, who was up here more, and he was looking towards this area here. Now, can you see the first burial site from where you're at, from that location? Yes, it's the tree I spoke about earlier. This is the tree where JJ was buried underneath. This right here is the pond. You can see just a, a little bit more taller shrubs around the top of the pond area. But this is the tree that JJ was buried underneath. Well, so is it fair to say that either from the front or the middle of Mr. Daybell's front yard, you can see that location easily. That's correct. Detective, what did you observe in States Exhibit C, 10C? When I testified, I was tasked with sifting through the fire pit. Uh, this is what we deemed the fire pit. Uh, it had burnt um, tree limbs. There was various little pieces of trash. Um, it was in the middle of round cinder blocks. So that's what we deemed the fire pit. And, and the way it appears in that image, that's the way you found it that day? Correct. It was that morning, yes. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 10B? This is just north of the driveway that Mr. Dago was sitting in, looking in the same direction. So it's, we're standing on the west side looking east. And that is the uh, tree. And then here's the pond area right here. Detective, I'm going to put up states exhibit 10A again. And if you can uh, point to the approximate location of where this picture was taken from. So that last photograph was taken from this area right here. And so it's fair to say from, from that location, you can easily see burial site number one. Judge, I'm going to object at this point because there's been some leading questions. I'll sustain that last question as leading. From that perspective, what were you able to observe? Burial site, number one, JJ's burial site. Was it difficult for you to observe it from that location? The actual uh, grave site on the ground, yes, from that location, but where the tree and the pond are, no, it wasn't difficult. Detective, what did you observe in States Exhibit 10E? So I testified earlier about the difference in uh, length of grass and shrubs in that six by six section that was marked off next to the pond. This is what I'm referring to. If you look close, you can see um, there's, there's smaller grass and dirt protruding right here. Um, it, this is probably a little bit difficult to see. There's probably a better photograph. But this is longer shrubs through here. And then in here was, was uh, like the length of sod and some dirt where there was nothing growing. And when yesterday you testified, when you called over to burial site one, is that what it looked like when you got over there? That's correct. Can you describe to the jury what you saw with in States Exhibit 10 F? So when I spoke about ERT removing the topsoil and the top level of shrubs, this is what I was speaking about. And you can start to see the, the three large white rocks I was talking about earlier starting to come through the dirt. 
you testified yesterday about a smell. Was this the same time that you began to smell what you described yesterday? Yes, as, as soon as they removed this and um, the topsoil, that's when you instantly, I instantly can smell the smell of immediately closing the body. Doctor, can you tell the jury what you saw in the state's exhibit 10? Or I'm sorry, MG. So as the ERT team methodically removed the soil around the white rocks and dug down just a little bit deeper, this is what we saw. You can start to see there's a smaller rock with the three large white rocks starting to show through clearly. When I testify that there was thin wood paneling underneath the white rocks, you can start to see the edge of that piece of wood paneling underneath the rocks. We also noticed that there were roots cut that the ERT team didn't cut. They were already pre-cut. Some of the roots are fairly thick, so that was something we observed as well in that very Thank you. Describe to the jury what you saw in the state's the 10 page. After the ERT team removed the white rocks, this is the two pieces of wood paneling that were underneath. What did you observe in states of the 10 I? I spoke earlier about the distinction in soil. Some of the soil looked wet or moist, some of it looked dry. <clears throat> Excuse me. What you're looking at here is once we removed the wood paneling, this is what was underneath. And you can start to see the distinction through here of the wet soil. And up here is just the dry soil. So the rocks and the paneling were all through here. So that was the other thing that we observed. And as we took the paneling off, the, the odor began to become a lot stronger. Um, so we, we knew we were at the right spot. Your Honor, I apologize for being delayed. I wonder if we could just have a very brief sidebar regarding the removal of this. Sorry.
Stuart, you can continue. Thank you. Detective, can you explain to the jury what you observed in Stacey's exhibit 10? Mm -hmm. So once we started removing the wet soil, and I testified earlier to a black round object protruding through the dirt, this is what we started to see. It appeared to be like tight wrapped black plastic. It, it wasn't very too far in, which was fairly shallow. That's what we started to see. And I talked about what appeared to be a crown of the human head. When can you describe what you saw in Stacey's of the head? Mm -hmm. So once that appeared, ERT team leader Steve Daniels used a small sharp instrument, and I testified that he made a slit through the black plastic. And you can see the black plastic kind of peeled away um, on the top of the head, and then I testified there was a white piece of plastic underneath, and this is the white piece of plastic here. He made a slit in the white plastic. And, and when he did that, um, you can see what appeared to be brown human hair. Um, some of the hair kind of came out with the sharp instrument, and that's the, the hair you can see on top of the white plastic. But that's what we are looking for. Can tell the jury what you observed at State's Exhibit 10L? Once the ERT team continued excavating, they removed all the soil um, on top of, of this small body that was wrapped in completely black plastic. I testified that it appeared to take the shape of a small body of black plastic. And this is what we saw here. It's probably a four by two grave, and I'm guessing at, at that, those measurements. Um, but it, it started to take the shape of a small body, and then it had these different pieces of duct tape throughout the black plastic on top. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10M? Once we lifted JJ out of the ground, there was still wet soil underneath where he was laying. And that is, that's body decomposition. The body had to begin to break down. So that's what the wet soil is through here. Again, you can see the, the roots that were cut to be able to put in this location. Detective, once that body was recovered, uh, what did you do? Oh, and I, to clarify that question, once that body was taken out of the ground, what did you do? I assisted uh, the coroner and a few other officers in 
placing JJ in the body bag, the black body bag. Uh, corner locked the body bag for evidence. We then put it in the back of the coroner's vehicle. Um, the coroner and the Fremont County deputy drove the uh, vehicle up to the morgue and myself and Lieutenant Rockwell followed behind that vehicle. Uh, once we were at the morgue, uh, JJ was placed in the morgue um, and then we returned back to the Dave residence. Do you recall who the Fremont County coroner was? Brenda Dye. And do you recall what other officers traveled with you to the hospital? In my vehicle, it was just Lieutenant Ron Ball um, with the coroner, Brenda Dye, I believe it was Detective Kai Pagani. And, and just for clarification, you have said this already, I apologize, but um, where, what hospital did you take me to? Madison Memorial Hospital. And where is that located? In the city of Richmond. <clears throat> once, uh, once you finished that task, what was the next step for your investigation? Mm -hmm. We returned back to uh, the Dave residence. As we got there, we were told that they had possibly Judge, I'm going to object at this point. There's some hearsay. I'll, I'll ask another question. Yeah. Um, without telling the jury what anyone told you, what did you do when you got back to the residence? We assisted in a second burial site. And when you got back to the residence, did you observe? Another burial site being looked at? I did. Where was that located? So through the course of our investigation, uh, we learned that the Daybell family had deemed a section of the backyard as what they referred to as a pet cemetery. And, and we knew through talking to family members that the pet cemetery had a little uh, black dog statue next to a post. That, that kind of signified where the pet cemetery was. And so when I returned back from dropping JJ off at, at the morgue, I observed ERT digging in the pet cemetery area. And did you aid in that excavation? I did. What did you personally do? ERT began taking off top layers of soil in, in this specific area in the pet cemetery. Um, once they began to again see wet soil start to protrude through the dry soil, they slowed down and um, we got on our hands and knees and began excavating that by hand. And by hand, did you use tools to do that? We did. They had small tools that we could use, um, trowels, like paintbrushes, things of that nature. Approximately what time of day was this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Say it was afternoon. Um, and approximately how many? People were there with you using hand tools. <clears throat> there was only a few of us um, at a time that, that could work because of the area, but also because of the smell. Um, we had to take turns digging because we were on our hands and knees, and the smell was so bad that you could only work for a few minutes before somebody else had to take turns, get on their hands and knees, and start. Digging by hand. And, and you, you said the smell, what, what did it smell like? Um, decomposing body. How long did you uh, aid in that excavation using the hand tools? Uh, hours, probably hours. And uh, did you find anything? We did. We ended up um, 
digging down and started to uncover burnt pieces of flesh, charred bone, fatty tissue, just, just, and I apologize for the lack of better words, but globs of burnt flesh starting to protrude through the dirt. Uh, and, and once you found that, uh, how long did you keep working that site that day? Um, we worked probably until probably four in the afternoon. And you mentioned ERT. Were they working there alongside you? They were. Um, they were also. There was also. Other areas being excavated as well, the fire pit still. Um, so everybody was kind of tasked with something different at that point. And, and once we started getting down a little bit more in that in Tylee's burial site, we assumed it was Tylee, we could start to see the top of what appeared to be uh, something plastic and green. Um, and at that point, the ERT team leader, Steve Daniels, decided we were, we were done for the evening. Um, when you were done for the evening, what happened? We had Fremont County Sheriff's Office, uh, the Madison County Fire Department, bring in two large uh, light trucks to illuminate the crime scene. The crime scene was taped off. We had officers from Rexburg City Police, um, deputies from Fremont County Sheriff's Office that remained on scene all night long, walking the perimeter to make sure that the scene wasn't compromised and it was well illuminated. And uh, did you return the next day? Yes, we did. And when you return the next day, uh, who else returned? <clears throat> uh, everybody that was there the previous day. So ERT came back. That's correct, yes. And other members of the FBI? Yes. Fremont County officers? Yes. Rexburg police officers? Correct. And we, I believe you testified earlier that there were some attorney general investigators there as well. Yes. And they were all there that second day. That's correct. Uh, well, approximately what time did you arrive that second day? We started fairly early. It was approximately uh, 7 in the morning. And um, what, did, what did you start doing when you got there on the second day? I went back to Tyler's burial site. Um, we had put up canopies uh, to keep sunlight and wind. There was uh, media helicopters flying overhead, so we wanted to keep the scene from being compromised as much as we possibly could. And at that point, we got back down on our hands and knees and began digging again um, with those same little tools to, to get down to see what exactly we were going to take out of the ground at that point. All right. And um, so, so, and then what happened next? Did you continue to do that work? Like I said, we, we would take turns digging because the smell was so bad. And we, we would just keep excavating slowly around this green object that started to come through the dirt the first day. So it started to take a shape, a roundish shape, when we began digging down and methodically removing dirt. And at that point, we could start to see what appeared to be uh, the shape of, of a green melted bucket um, that appeared to have the remains of we assume more tightly that were charred and burned inside it. 
Uh, and were you there for the excavation of that bucket? Yes. How did that happen? Once we got down to what we thought was the bottom of the um, disformed bucket, we observed part of a, a human skull underneath the bucket. There were some teeth that we ended up excavating from underneath. At that point, the goal was to lift that out of the ground. And so there was a little, we made kind of a little hole around it to try to get underneath. So we put tarps out. Um, like I said, the goal was to try to lift it completely out without manipulating it in any way. But when we tried to do that, when we lifted it, mm. It all broke apart because there was nothing holding it together. So at that point, we had to go back in and remove all the pieces of the charred flesh and burnt bone and organs and pieces of tile that were put onto the top. And uh, while you were doing that, you talked about the smelling. Is that still present? Yes, very much so. Strong odor, yes. Were you, were you able to observe the um, lack of a better word, total removal of, of that green bucket and its contents from that excavation site? We were able to lift everything out at that point. Um, we put it on the blue tarp. There were photographs taken, measurements taken by ERT. Um, once that was completed, we dug down even further to make sure we didn't miss anything. Once we figured out everything was out of the ground, that tarp and those and Tyler's remains were then put into a body bag. And the coroner again bought the body bag for evidence purposes. And Tyler was also transported to the morgue. And did you uh, did you follow along when Tyler was transferred to the morgue like you did with JJ? We did. We followed in the same manner, um, myself and Lieutenant Ball. Once Tyler was placed in the morgue, he returned back to the Dale residence. Your Honor, I'm going to be asked to ask that the witness be handed states exhibits 11A through 11G. And Judge, for the record, I've previously reviewed these and I will object to the admission of these as exhibits. All right, exhibits 11A through 11G are admitted without objection. Yep. This time, as we get into this evidence, I'm going to announce that because of the graphic nature of some of this evidence, I'm not going to be showing this on the court's live stream, nor to the general public in the courtroom. The jurors will be viewing the evidence as well as the parties are permitted to see that. Addition, the court will provide an opportunity for any victims that wish to see the evidence in a private setting to view it as it's now been admitted into the record. Uh, but we made arrangements to not display this to the general public. And so, Mr. Wood, with these exhibits, that's how we'll proceed. And as we will not include that on the live stream, but you can discuss it on the record uh, and open public as a witness. Okay. Can you review the bags of those exhibits?
And your honor, I understand these are already admitted. I am still ask a few foundation questions just to establish knowledge. Very well, for the record. Detective, what do those, uh, what does states exhibit 11 and 14 and its sub parts? Photograph of that cemetery and photographs of Kylie as, as we took her out of the ground in her burial site. And were these photographs taken on June 9th and 10th? That's correct, yes. And were you were you on the scene that day when those photographs were taken? Yes. And are they true and accurate representations of what you saw? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, those exhibits having been admitted, I'd ask to publish them. Sure. Uh, Detective, before I publish that, I'm going to play states exhibit 10A up again. And can you point to the general location of what you've described as the pet cemetery? Right here. So what can you have on the record and explain where it's pointing? Yes. Yeah. Detective, will you explain where you're pointing? It's just east of this shop area and just north of the fire pit. So it's right through here. And Your Honor, I do think that the state's first picture under State's Exhibit 11 is, is okay for public consumption. It is. I just wanted to make sure our system was working as well, but Exhibit 11A is fine. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11A? <clears throat> this is where we began excavating briefly. Um, as you can see in this photograph, there's a small black dog statue next to the post. So that's where we had uh, learned this was the pet cemetery area and talking to family members. And then there's just some tarps laid out for some of the soil. You can see in the back the markers that had been distinguished. Um, and laid out by ERT for the fire pit area that I had talked about earlier. And Your Honor, I think at this point it's appropriate to turn into the public access. I agree. <clears throat> You know, I'm at a bit of a, I have no idea if this is, I can't see if this, well, I'll ask, Detective, can you see that image in your monitor? Yes. Can you see most of it? Yes. Can you describe for the jury what's been marked as state's exhibit 11B? What did you observe there? Can I see it? Um, is there a way I can use the pointer? I have a suggestion also, Mr. Wood, just because I understand what you're doing to try to line that up since you can't see the monitor. Do you want to set um, a notepad or something on there and get it oriented that you could set on top of that just so that it's lined up? And if I could. Have the screen for one moment. Thank you. You don't have that suggestion. Okay. Um, 
Detective, what did you observe in the state's Exhibit 11B? Uh, it's hard to describe that from here, but I'll do the best. In the middle of that photograph, you can start to see the different color and the changes in the soil from dry to a wet, moist dirt. Start to see to the left just a little bit of that there. You can see the white piece sticking out and it's burnt on top, and that's charred bone that's starting to stick out, and all the little pieces next to it uh, are are pieces of burnt flesh, uh, tissue, or we we later. Uh, determine for organs that were all kind of that's the top of what was inside the bucket. So that's what we first started to see when we started to exit. At this point, were you still using the hand tools? Oh, yes. Explain for the jury what, what you observed in states of the middle of the sea. So, as we started to excavate down further, some of the top of the mass of burnt flesh wasn't really attached to anything. And so, when we would start to, to uh, dig away towards the sides, it, it would kind of come apart. It wasn't, it wasn't part of that original mass. And so what you're looking at on this blue tarp is burnt flesh still attached to some bone. The upper upper left part of that um, that section that you're looking at is part of the hip bone that still has burnt flesh attached to it and, and dirt and uh, yeah, just fatty burnt tissue. You described the jury uh, what you observed in states exhibit 11 D. So, when I talked about it started to take a roundish shape, this is what I'm referring to. And we dug around the sides of it, trying to get to the bottom, because, like I said, the goal was to, to get underneath, have three or four guys in there, and just lift it onto the tarp. So that's what you're looking at in this photograph is just the the uh, burnt flesh that's still just kind of inside that area. And Judge, could we approach for a sidebar, please? Yes. <laughs>
And that's part of the human scroll just to the right of that, the green bucket. There were teeth there in the dirt as well. But that's what you're looking at, it's just a close up of the bottom of it. What can you explain for the jury what you observed in states exhibit 11 and So once we, we removed that mass and put it on the blue tarp, there was still some wet soil underneath. So we dug down even further to make sure that we could excavate everything we needed. So what you're looking at, you can see the, the tarps in the background we had put up. Um, you can see the hand, some of the hand tools that we used just to the right of that pole. But that's what you're looking at, is just after we got that mass out, the wet soil. Detective, what did you observe in states of the 11 G? So these were part of a tile that kind of broke apart when we tried to lift it out of the ground. Um, there's pieces of charred bone. There's parts of a skull on the bottom left covered in dirt, and they're still burnt. Rotting flesh still attached to the bone. So that's what you're looking at that one. These were the pieces that broke off. Fact that I believe you testified that you um, you assisted in transferring um, those remains to Madison County to the hospital, correct? Correct. I followed behind the coroner. Um, was Lieutenant Ball with you again? He was. Once you got up to the hospital, what did you do? We observed the Fremont County Coroner bred to die transfer Tylee's remains into the morgue. The, the morgue was then locked, but there was evidence they put up. And at that point, uh, myself and Lieutenant Ball went back to the defendant, Davos. Residents. And, and what did you do when she got back there? We assisted and made sure there were no other burial sites or anything that the ERT team needed assistance with. At that point, we decided that we were going to take JJ and Tylee to the Ada County Coroner's office um, to have an autopsy performed. So roughly four in the afternoon on Jan June 10th, 2020, it was decided that we were going to follow the county coroner with the remains of JJ and Tylee to the AD County Coroner's Office for an autopsy the next morning. And when did you arrive in Ada County, approximately? Uh, approximately eight or nine in the evening on June 10th. And what did you do once you got there? We went directly to the coroner's office and JJ and Tylee were dropped off and the coroner's office took custody of both JJ and Tylee. Um, 
So that was late later in the evening for a, uh, an, was an autopsy performed that night? No. When was the autopsy? The yeah, judge, I'm going to object. There needs to be some accommodation. Uh, overruled. If you know, you can answer. The autopsy was performed June 11th, uh, early morning hours. So that's, that was the next day. Correct. And were you were you present for that? Yes, I was. And where did that autopsy take place? At the Ada County Coroner's Office. So when you arrived at the coroner's office, what did you do first? Initially, when we arrived, uh, we had a little debrief with the medical examiner, Garth Warren. He told us what he judge Objection. It's grounds for your side. Same. You met with Dr. Ward. Correct. What was the purpose of that meeting? To debrief us on what to expect that morning. Um, what did you do next? We went to the room where the autopsy was performed. We put the sanitary movies on our shoes, signed in on a whiteboard with our name and cell phone numbers. So he had a record of everybody that was in the room. And at that point, we stood back. Um, it's the, the wall and observed the autopsy. Now, as a detective, you don't perform an autopsy, correct? Correct. But you were able to see, uh, see it take place. That's correct. Uh, and what did you observe happening during that autopsy? One of his team members brought out the uh, body bag. And I recognized it to be the same body bag that we took from Defendant Davos' backyard that day because it still had dirt on it. It still had the same lock. And at that point, they opened the body bag and revealed the same black plastic and small body that appeared to be in the black plastic. And, and then what did you observe? Dr. Warren and his team cut down the middle of the black plastic to open up what was inside. At that time, I observed a small child with duct tape on his head from his chin to his forehead area tightly wrapped around his head. He had red pajama pants on, red pajama shirt. He had his arms folded this way across his body. And there was duct tape from elbow all the way around to his other elbow. He had his ankles also bound with duct tape. He was still wearing um, his nighttime pull-up diaper. He had black socks with the word sketchers in orange. Um, I could tell that he was going through various states of decomposition based on his skin color. Judge, I'm going to object. Or else he doesn't have the experience to make a determination about the levels of decomposition. He's speculating. But I'll Sustain the objection and strike the final part of the answer about the decomposition, Mr. Williams. All right. Detective, what did the body's skin look like? The, the skin was sloughing. It appeared to be bluish green, black, yellow. Um, and through my training experience, going through and handling different dead bodies at different stages of decomposition. That's what I recommend. Judge, I'm going to object again. There's been no foundation for him to make that sort of medical assessment. He's not a medical doctor. Your Honor, my argument would be that's not a medical assessment. It makes it on his training experience. 
I'll overrule the objection. If you'd like to cross further, you don't have a chance, Mr. Pryor. The objection is overruled. The foundation laid in the previous response. Detective, once, uh, once this uh, the body was taken out of the bag, and you made the observations that you've just described. What happened next? Dr. Warren and his team then cut the the white plastic that was wrapped around his head and duct taped. They cut down the middle to reveal what was underneath. At that point, I observed another piece of duct tape stretched from JJ's jawline to jawline over his mouth. He also cut the several layers of duct tape from his arms, and it revealed uh, some more duct tape that had his wrist bound underneath all those layers of duct tape. He then took his uh, bottom pajamas off and shirt, and it also revealed the nighttime pull-up diaper he was still wearing. Now, detective, um... You spoke about the duct tape and bag over over the head, correct? Correct. And uh, you've been referring to this as JJ. Yes. Um, until that duct tape and bag were removed, though, were you able to identify him as JJ? No. Once they removed the duct tape and the bag, through looking at all the photographs for the last eight months of JJ, I recognized him to be the same little boy laying on that table as JJ Bell. He had the same hairstyle, shorter on the sides, longer on top. At that point, I recognized him as JJ. Uh, once the clothing was removed, what did you observe happen next? Uh, Dr. Warren pointed out some bruising. Um, on his arms, on his ankles, on his chest. He also pointed out some scratch marks on the left side of his neck, just under the duct tape. Um, at that point, uh, Dr. Warren and his team performed the autopsy. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be shown on state's exhibits 12A through 12B. E. A through B. E. E. B. Thank you. E. At the theory here, if those exhibits are going to have a chance to. Yeah. Do you recognize states and tenants 12A through E? Yes. What do they purport to be? JJ Bell laying on the table after they opened the black classic. And were you present when those pictures were taken? 
Yes, you were in the same room. Right. Uh, are those true and accurate representations of what you observed back then? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the state's exhibits 12A through E entered into evidence. No objection, Judge. Very well. 12A through E are admitted. All of these are graphic in nature. Will not be just, uh, published or shelved on the court's live feed or to the public in the courtroom. They'll be published to the jurors, however, if you wish to split. Thank you. Detective, can you describe the jury what you observed in states exhibit 12A? Once they removed the black plastic that JJ Vallow was in, this is the first thing you saw. You can see on the white plastic on top of his head, that's the slit that was made um, when his head was sticking out of the ground. And you can see the duct tape I testified to wrapped around his entire face. His red pajamas are still soaked with body decomposition. Um, the level of duct tape on his arms is what really caught my attention. Um, and he still has the white, he has a white and blue child blanket wrapped around him. You described the jury what you observed in states to the 12 B. This is the JJ's legs, his bottom half, he has his red pajama pants on still. Uh, his ankles, like I testified, are wrapped with duct tape. Uh, those are his black sketcher socks that he had on. It's hard to see there too, but his, his legs and, and body are also so in decomposition as well. You described to the jury what you saw in states of the 12 C. When I spoke earlier that Dr. Warren cut down the white plastic in the duct tape that was covering his head, this is what we saw. Um, you can see the other layer of duct tape around his mouth that went from jawline to jawline. You can see his hair, brown hair still was matted down to his head, um, wet, so with body decomposition. But at that point, I was able to still recognize him as J.J. Bell. Did you observe in 12D? That's the white bag that was covering his head. That looks like blood in the bag. It's actually body decomposition, just breaking down. Um, it appeared to be a normal trash bag in a red drawstring. And you can see, if you look close, it had the waffle style pattern, um, the expandable type trash bag. There's still pieces of duct tape that are attached. That's what that photograph depicts. You described the picture of the sun, 12B. That's just another photo of JJ. The tape is starting to lose its stickiness because of the way the, the body is. It's just a, a different photo or a different uh, angle of JJ's face.
Bit earlier than normal, but we are going to take the mid morning recess at this time. We will reconvene here about uh, widely before 10 30 to get us started with additional testimonies. All rise, please. <laughs>
Thank you. Please be seated. Council, if you're ready, we'll have the jurors brought back in. All rise. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Please be seated. We're back on the record then on case CR 22211623, just concluded the morning recess. Uh, Detective Colonel CEO is still under oath. And Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue with your direct, you can do that at this time. Thank you. I uh, detective, I think when we left off, we were speaking about the autopsy of JD Bell, correct? Correct. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that you did observe the, the actual, not only the body, but then the autopsy of JJ Bell. That's correct. And were you present for that entire autopsy? Yes, I was. And uh, when that autopsy was concluded, uh, what did you do? At that time, uh, Dr. Warren and his team removed JJ from that autopsy table. Then they then brought out a second, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, black body bag. And I recognized it to be same body back from the scene because it also had dirt. And they placed that body back on the table. And what did you observe next? Dr. Warren and his team opened the body bag, um, looked at the remains for what was left as far as remains inside. Um, he stated there was nothing he could do at that time with an autopsy. So to the time to move to strike as hearsay. Here on the statement on the yeah. Another move to strike. So, <coughs> did you repeat the question? Uh, what did you observe? Uh, what were you, you had just talked about? The uh, tiny remains being brought out with Jericho. 
Um, once the remains were brought out, Dr. Warren opened the bag and looked at the remains and stated that there was nothing he could do at that point. So at that time, uh, we left the autopsy room for the day. And when you left, did you do anything in furtherance of your investigation that day? No. Did you return to the data county coroner's office uh, the next day? We did on June 12th, um, 2020. We went back to the Ada County Coroner's Office. Um, at that point, Lieutenant Ball took custody of some of the evidence and we transported it to the state lab in Meridian. And you were, were you with Lieutenant Ball when you did that? I was, yes. And once you took it to the state lab, what did you do? Uh, those items were checked into the state lab. And then that concluded what we did for that day. Detective, you spoke earlier about some of the other agencies you've worked with in this investigation. And I, is it correct you worked with Fremont County? Correct, yes. And I, I believe you testified that your primary focus in this investigation was looking for Tylee and JJ. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Uh, was there a, an investigation in Fremont County at the same time that uh, had connections to your investigation? Yes, there was. What was that investigation? Fremont was investigating the death of Tammy Daybell. Uh, who was married to the defendant, Chad Daybell, kind of the exact same time we were doing our investigation with missing children. Right. And would you uh, meet with Fremont County and discuss the cases together? Yes, we would. And would you, would you aid each other in those investigations? Yes. Would you share information? Yes. Detective, were you, are you aware of any event involving Tammy Daybell on October 9th, 2019? Yes, I am. Uh, how did you become aware of that event? Through the course of sharing information with the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, you were advised. Judge, uh, can we approach? Yes. <clears throat> I want to have the court reporter, if we could, read back Mr. Wood's previous question before the sidebar, and then I'll see if there's an objection held by defense. Question, how did you become aware of that event? Is there an objection to that, Mr. Pryor? No, not to that question. Okay, then Mr. Wood just proceed with another question. I don't think that there's no objection to the question. I don't it's been answered yet. Okay. You can answer. We were uh, advised through the course of our investigation that 
Judge, I'm going to object at this point. The question is whether he was advised, not what he was advised of, but whether he was advised. Our response, Mr. Wood? I'm not quite sure I understand the objection, Your Honor. Uh, I don't as well, so you can continue with your response. Can you repeat the question? Please. Uh, how did you become aware of the events of October 9th, 2019? Through the course of our investigation, we were aware of those events through uh, speaking with Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Uh, why was it important to, to you in investigating your case? To share information and receive information from Fremont County. It was important because the uh, suspects in that case were the exact same suspects in our case. And so we wanted to make sure that we shared information so nothing was missed. At that point, we were still looking for two small children. And so it was imperative to us that we shared information and gathered information from neighboring counties and anybody that that was involved with this case and did you also uh, confer with arizona law enforcement we did yes detective are you aware of who charles vallow was yes who was he charles vallow was married to lori vallow great is he alive no he is not do you know when he died? Charles died July 11th, 2019. Are you aware of how he died? Charles was shot by Alex Cox, Lori's brother. Now you testified earlier that your initial involvement in this case involved looking for a Jeep. That's correct. And I believe you, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you testified that you were looking for that Jeep because it was requested by Arizona law enforcement. That's correct, yes. And are you aware of why they were looking for that Jeep? Yes, I am. Why were they looking for that Jeep? That Jeep was a suspect in an attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreau, who was Lori's he was married to Lori's niece, Melanie Boudreau. The suspect in that homicide was also Alex Cox. Detective, going back to October 9th, 2019 in Canada, are you aware um, of the incident that took place with Dan Dado? Yes, I am. What was it? Judge, I'm going to object. There's no foundation as to how he became aware of it. Sustain. Through your investigation, did you become aware of what happened to the video? Yes, I did. And how did you become aware of that information? Sharing information with Fremont County. And so was this part of the collective knowledge of the case that you were working on? That's correct, yes. And did you... Did you aid in that investigation as well? I did. So you personally became aware of these events? Correct. Uh, based, based on your knowledge and your investigation, are you aware of any event involving Tammy Daybell on October 9th, 2018? Judge, again, there hasn't been proper foundation. I think at this point I've established that it's through the investigation and not the counter. These objections overruled. You can answer the question. Yes, I'm aware. And what was that event? On October 9th, 2019, Tammy Daybell believes that she was shot at in the driveway of the defendant Daybell's residence. And are you, when you say shot at, did she, are you aware of what she, how she thought she was shot at? She initially reported that it was a, possibly a paintball gun. Did 
Detective, in in your investigation, did you ever put together timelines of events that took place? Yes, I did. Why is it important to do that? Just to establish who uh, the key figures were and the key dates to aid in our investigation so we can make sure that we share the accurate and correct information with the other agencies. And in preparing for this trial, did you prepare any charts of key figures to aid the jury in understanding your testimony and the testimony of the trial? Yes, I did. And was that based on your involvement in the case? Yes. And your investigation? Correct. And uh, and based on information, I'm, I'm sorry, that wasn't very well said, based on the information you gained from your investigation? That's correct. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 30. Detective, do you have states exhibit 30 in your hand? Yes, I do. What does it report to be? Those are the key figures that I put together as far as the investigation goes, photographs. And did you do that to aid this jury in understanding who the people involved in this case are? Yes. And you, did you do that in anticipation of your testimony? Yes, I did. Right. And are those, the, the pictures attached with those names, can you, are those true and accurate rep representations of those of the individuals attached to those names? Yes, they are. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes only, the state would move to enter State's Exhibit 30 into evidence. Any objection? For demonstrative purposes, no. Very well. Exhibit 30 is correct for that reason. <clears throat> May I publish? Yes. <clears throat> If you, can, if you can just use your pointer and just for purposes of the record, read the names attached with each picture. Sure. This is Lori Vallow Dayville, Charles Vallow, Alex Cox, who is Lori's brother, Chad Dayville, Tammy Dayville, his deceased wife, Tylee Ryan, who is a uh, daughter to Lori. J.J. Vallow was a son to Lori, and Melanie Kalowski Boudreau, she was remarried, is the niece to Lori Vallow. And when you say that uh, J.J. was Lori Vallow Dayville's son, was he also Charles Vallow's son? Yes, he was. And that was by way of adoption, correct? That's correct. And so Alex Cox was J.J. and Tyler's uncle? Yes. Detective, similar to that last chart, did you prepare a timeline in anticipation of your testimony? Yes, I did. And did you do that based on your experience and knowledge of the case? Yes, I did. And it was based on information you gained through your investigation? That's correct. And did you do that to aid the jurors in understanding just the basic timeline of, of the events that happened in this case? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the witness be handed states exhibit 31.
Judge, could we approach please with a sidebar? Yes.
this time, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there's an evidentiary issue to resolve, which we are going to take up outside of the presence of the jury. We'll do that as quickly as we can. So uh, I will be off the bench while I research this momentarily, then we'll come back on and make a ruling outside of the jury's presence, bring them back in and do evidence. All rise, please. <laughs> May be seated.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we are back on the record on CR 2221-1623. We are gonna take up the objection outside of the presence of the jury as it relates to the state's proposed exhibit, in this case, particularly state's proposed exhibit 31. And the court uh, had to go back and review some prior rulings in the case that occurred some time ago. Uh, I've done that now. So the what I'd like to go through is the proffer and determination if there's still a objection to the exhibit and make a ruling on that outside of the jury's presence. So Mr. Wood has offered exhibit 31, which is a timeline. And Mr. Pryor, does the defense maintain an objection to the admission of that timeline? Judge, I spoke with this today. I spoke with Ms. Blake and procedurally, I think at the time that the 404B was filed by the state, we were also dealing with the severance issue is what I recall. And then she discussed that with me. So I think I may have made a, a, a non-objection to the 404B. And I think I made a record of that uh, when Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald were, uh, uh, were objecting to that. So I, I may have, I may for, forego my objection because I think um, my recollection is I didn't, I don't have a record of it yet, which is a little unusual, but uh, I think I may have uh, noted on the record to the court that I'm not objecting to the introduction of the 404B evidence. All right, I understand. I think there was lodged an objection back February 14th of 2023 by you to the 404B motion. Does the state have a clarification on that, Mr. Lloyd? Your Honor. Your Honor, just based on recollection, I believe there was there were it was a not an objection to all of the states intended for or be but to some of it. And I my recollection, and I'm not looking at any document, this is just my recollection, uh, was that uh, the defendant did stipulate to some of the 404B, uh, including uh, issues dealing with Charles Ballow and Brandon Goudreau. That's my recollection. And Judge, my recollection is that I did file a timely objection, but then at the hearing, there was, and, and I'm going back, Judge, and we're talking three years, two, three years ago, um, and I'm just going off a of recollection as well, as Mr. Wood is. I believe that I filed an objection, and then at the time of the hearing, I may have orally stated that I'm not objecting to the introduction of the Brandon Boudreaux or the uh, Charles Fallow information and Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald continued theirs and the hearing was continued on and somewhere in the interim judge, uh, there was a severance order granted. And I don't know whether I was part of the 404B motion. That's where I'm having some difficulty in recollection. And my records don't show an order that you granted the 404B in this case. So I don't see an order in this case. Okay. Um, so, just to clarify, there was an objection was filed on behalf of Mr. Daybell by Mr. Pryor, February 14th, 2023, to the 404B. We then had a hearing on the 404B evidence on February 22nd, 2023. The court then issued an oral ruling on the record, and in that oral ruling went through uh, different evidence that was sought to be proffered under 404B. And among the rulings the court made on the court minutes under paragraph nine, specifically referencing consideration of the shooting at Mr. Boudreaux, the court weighed out the 404B arguments and found that it would be admissible at trial. And then uh, in the hearing, I did indicate that I'd gone through the 
analysis for 404 be looking at uh, the people state versus Fox case doing a two tiered way with the factors balancing them out with the evidence proffered um, and ultimately uh, and I'm looking at the transcript of this hearing where I may be all willing determining finally uh, quote, the court does find there is relevance under tier one, parts one and two for the introduction of that evidence. And then I looked at rule 403 to see if the uh, there was probative value to substantially outweigh the danger of unfair prejudice. And finally determined that as to the attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreau, there would be more probative than unfairly prejudicial as it would relate back to the purported plan of the defendants. So the court did find that the state was permitted to introduce that 404B evidence. So as we stand here, uh, knowing procedurally that's the ruling on the timeline, I guess I'll first come back to this proposed Exhibit 31 and ask if there's any objection at this point for the defense, Mr. Pryor. No, Judge. Okay. So. Exhibit 31 then has been offered and will be admitted. Um, I would also note on the record that I think the board has been open to discuss that anyway based on opening argument as well. But for that reason, and also based on the court's prior determination made, uh, I am going to permit that reference on 404B evidence. Um, the reason I'm still discussing this for counsel is I think this now uh, triggers a requirement that I give a limiting instruction to the jurors about how 404B evidence is considered. And I do have to prepare a limiting instruction that uh, I am going to advise them of at such point as after your exhibit's been offered, Mr. Wood. Okay. Okay, thanks for the delay there. If we could bring the jurors back in, please. This is, I don't know where the, yeah. I've got the actual, <laughs> and Judge, if I could just quickly inquire before the jury comes back in, the court did have both pages of that, and it's, I don't, I only have a uh, first page. Okay, I, once we get done with this, we'll just bring that up. Okay. All right. Uh, jury is present and for. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, apologies for that delay. We were working through an evidence issue. I will note that the state has offered Exhibit 31, which has now been admitted by the court. It's a timeline. It does make some references in there that uh, for me at this time, I think would be best to give the jurors a special limiting instruction. So I'll read this instruction to the jurors at this time. 
Ladies and gentlemen, during the course of this trial, evidence will be introduced for the purpose of showing that the defendant committed acts other than for which the defendant is on trial. Such evidence, if believed, is not to be considered by you to prove the defendant's character or that the defendant has a disposition to commit crimes. Rather, such evidence may be considered by you only for the limited purpose of proving the defendant's motive, opportunity, intent, plan, or absence of mistake or accident. So that instruction provided, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to proceed with that exhibit you missed. Your Honor, I don't have any What? Well, I believe the uh, witness does. May I publish? Yes. Uh, just briefly before I do, uh, Detective, we, before we took a break, we spoke about uh, timeline you prepared. Correct. And the reason you prepared that was to aid the jury in understanding the events of this case. Yes. If you, can, if you can take your pointer and uh, and go through these events and just read them into the record. July 11th, 2019, Charles Vallow dies. September 2nd through September 3rd, 2019, Lori Alex and the kids, JJ and Tyler, moved to Rexburg, Idaho. The last known proof of life for Tylee was September 8, 2019. The last known proof of life for JJ was September 22, 2019. The attempted shooting at Brenton Boudreaux, Gilbert, Arizona, for attempted homicide, excuse me, October 2, 2019. The attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell, October 9th, 2019. The death of Tammy Daybell, October 19th, 2019. And if you'll be on the second page. November 1st, police receive a call about a Jeep. The Jeep is located November 4th, 2019. Chad and Lori get married in Kauai, November 5th, 2019. Welfare check on JJ, November 26th, 2019, which is the same day Alex and Chad were contacted. The Rexburg Police Department searched Lori and Alex's apartments November 27th, 2019. Search warrant served on the Daybell residence was June 9th on 2020. JJ and Tyler were taken to the Ada County Corners office June 10th, 2020. And the autopsy was conducted June 11th of 2020. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Pryor, cross examination. Would the, like, judge, would the court like me to start, or would you or like to take a break at the lunch break? Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the cross and go till at least 10, please. Okay. Good afternoon, Good morning, officer. Good morning, sir. We do know each other. We've at least exchanged pleasantries a couple of times. Yes, sir. In the past. Uh, and I guess for purposes of this hearing, would you prefer that I refer to you as lieutenant or officer? Lieutenant's fine. 
Mr. Pryor, I apologize very much for the interruption. I wanted to confirm something on that last exhibit. It was entered by the court. Is that a demonstrative exhibit? That's what I understand. Either as a demonstrative or a summary. Okay, thank you, Council. Apologies for the interruption. Judge, I'm also looking for the note. I found it. So, Lieutenant, um, you've been involved in a number of aspects in regards to this case, right? That's correct. You've done some investigation on your own in terms of uh, a welfare check with Lori Vallon, is that right? Yes. Uh, but you've also interviewed a number of witnesses, is that correct? Yes. You interviewed Melanie Gibb, David Warwick, right? Yes. Several times? A few times. And you've interviewed a number of other witnesses as it relates to this case, is that correct? Yes. Okay, now you previously discussed um, uh, your role as a uh, police officer and investigator in this case. And I guess I want to clarify something if you could, please. Um, as a police officer investigating a case, your role is to conduct the investigation, right? Look at the facts. Correct. Try to establish and get some gain some information, right? Correct. But you're not supposed to judge one way or the other, right? You're supposed to remain neutral. That's correct. And you're not supposed to narrow that role as a police officer to a particular person. Is that correct? That's correct. In other words, you're supposed to look at the evidence as a whole. And rather than focusing on one person and saying, we're going to assume this person did this, and we're going to build our case around prosecuting that person. That would be inappropriate, wouldn't it? Right. Your role is actually to look at all the evidence, consider all the evidence. And once you've gathered all the evidence that you think is relevant to a case, what do you do with that evidence? We follow the evidence. Okay. And then once you follow the evidence, you, you've established a report or a, you know, you've come to a, Concluding your investigation, what do you do with that evidence that you concluded with? We put a case together. Okay, and then do you provide it to someone? We provide it to the prosecutors. Okay, so there's distinct roles as part of a uh, criminal case. You'd agree with that, right? Yes. And your role is to conduct an investigation, correct? Correct. Look into all possible evidence of any kind, correct? Correct. And view the evidence, right? Yes not make any determination as to what that evidence means, but rather gather as much evidence as you think is relevant in your mind and put together a compilation of that evidence, correct? Correct. Okay. And then at that point, only at that point, do you provide it to the prosecuting attorney and they make a determination as to whether or not uh, they will pursue charges against them. Do you understand? Is that the way you understand the process is supposed to work? Yes. Okay. And if you were not to follow that process, if you were not to follow what I just described, that wouldn't be appropriate. There's, there's protocols. You agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. And you should never um, blend the roles of a police officer with the role of a private, with the role of a uh, prosecuting attorney. You would agree with that, right? Explain what you mean by the land of the role. Well, I mean, it's not a prosecutor's role to show up at an, at an investigation when you're conducting an investigation and engage in part of the process of an interview of witnesses. You'd agree with that, right? I've had prosecutors show up to certain investigations. Okay, but that's not the norm, is it? Um, I, I think it depends on the investigation. Okay, okay. So in other words, uh, you think that it's appropriate that if a prosecutor is, is uh, deciding whether to, for, to pursue charges against somebody, that they should also participate in the interviewing of these witnesses as part of that process. Is that what you're telling me? I think it's important to, for a prosecutor to have all the information. Well, doesn't that create a problem in your mind? No, sir. Okay. Well, let me talk to you a little bit about 
Because if you're doing an investigation and you're really remaining neutral as part of that investigation, right? You're not supposed to make judgments, correct? Correct. You're supposed to look at the evidence, gather all the evidence, and then make a determination of what evidence you want to submit to a prosecuting attorney, right? Correct. Do you ever get involved in um, the process of deciding whether someone should be charged or not? What, what do you mean by that, sir? Well, after the evidence is all gathered, and after you've done your report as a police officer and put together all of the information, do you ever go over to the prosecutor's office and say, you know what, I put this evidence together, and you know what, uh, I want to have a discussion with you about whether or not we want to charge this person. That wouldn't be appropriate, would it? I'm going to object as argumentative. It's the same. Okay. But would it be appropriate for a prosecutor to interview witnesses and inject their personal opinion in those uh, in those processes of interviewing witnesses. Would that be proper under any circumstances? And yeah, I'm going to object as argumentative. I'll have a rule out objection. And could you repeat the question again? Yes. Um, Appropriate for a prosecutor to interview witnesses and inject their personal opinion in those in those processes of interviewing witnesses would that be proper under the circumstances? To interject their personal opinion, yeah, I would say probably not. Okay, so if you're engaging in name calling or, or making references to a person's character uh, in a case, that would clearly be an inappropriate act, would it not? Objection beyond the scope, Your Honor. That's sustained. And no, that's facts on it. Okay. Now, um, you spoke a little bit about this body cam issue. And um, you said that it was a policy that there's only one body cam among seven or ten of you as detectives. Is that right? No, sir. I never once said it was policy. I just said there was only one body cam. Oh, so it's in seven to ten. So in other words, you share a body cam. It's not a policy within the department. Correct. Okay. Is there a, is there a policy in the department about recording or or trying to preserve a record when you're interviewing witnesses? Yes. Okay. What's that policy, sir? When we interview and conduct interviews at the police department. Yeah. Those interviews are recorded. Okay. Now, what about if you're out in the field and you're conducting an, an interview? Is that to be recorded as well? There's no policy that says it has to be recorded. Okay. Do you carry a microphone as well, officer, other than a body cam? No, not on my person, I don't. Okay. Do you carry a cell phone while you're doing that that's issued by the county? Do I keep the cell phone in my car? Yes. I didn't ask you that. I said, do you carry a cell phone when you go out in the field? On my person or in my vehicle? Either one. In my vehicle. Okay. And does that cell phone have the technology that allows you to, to record or photograph uh, and, and videotape images? Yes, it does. Okay. So what I understand is on November 26, 2019, you were um, directed or you directed your folks to go out to the Lori Vallow residence. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and you said that you were with a couple, you were with um, Ron Ball, is that who you said you were with? At, at one time, yes, I was with a couple different officers that day. Oh, so tell me who you were with on, the, on that day, remind me. Detective Dave Holt. Okay. Detective David Stubbs. Okay. And Lieutenant Ron Ball. So there were four of you who went out there to uh, to locate or to find out some information about what again? Remind me. About the whereabouts of J.J. Vallow. Okay, and this was a, a concern that you uh, had because you were contacted by an, another law enforcement agency expressing concern about the safety of a young child, right? No, sir. Okay, tell me what was the purpose? It was a simple welfare, welfare check. Okay. And you went out on this welfare check, and there were, if, if my map is correct, please correct me. Uh, did all four of you detectives and, and lieutenants go out at the same time? No, sir. You went out at different times. Myself and Dave Hope went out initially. Okay, and then when did the other two officers show up? When I called them based on the 
lies that I had been told. Okay. And these lies that you've been told, um, at that point, you and Detective Hope, neither of you decided to bring a video camera, right? That's correct. And neither of you decided to wear a recorder to record any of the uh, incidents that took place about these so-called lies, right? That's correct. And nobody took out their phone and recorded it or made a video or audio recording of the discussion with Mr. Daybell or Mr. Cox on November 26, 2019, right? Let's hear it. And even after you said these so-called lies, even after you discovered that, uh, you know, Mr. Daybell apparently told you something that you didn't think was true, at that point, did you instruct any of the uh, officers who were coming to aid you? Maybe it's a good idea we should bring an audio with, uh, or a video camera with us or a, a mic to record some of these statements because I have some concerns. Did you think about that? We, we did that, sir. Hold on. Okay. I I'm going that there was an objection and sustaining the objection. So uh, strike the answer. You can ask another question, Mr. Pryor. And it was uh, Detective Stubbs who had the video cam, is that right? That's correct, sir. Okay. And that was when you video cam Ms. Vallow about when you had contact eventually with Ms. Vallow. Is that what the video uh, camera that you're talking about? I didn't have contact with, with Ms. Vallow. Now, um, I'm, I'm a little confused about something, uh, and maybe you can clear this up. You said that um, you asked Mr. Dayball first about whether he had Lori Vallow's phone number, correct? No, sir. I didn't contact Mr. Daywell until after I contacted Alex Cox. Okay. At some point, did you ask for Lori Vallow's phone number from Mr. Daywell? Yes, I did. Okay. And at no point did you ever make a threat to him saying you're going to turn this phone number over to us, right? No, sir. At no point did any other officer walk up to him and say, if you don't turn this phone number over, you're uh, going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. That never took place to your knowledge, right? Okay. But then after that, you're saying, at first he said, I'm not going to give you the phone number. And then out of the blue, he decides to give you the phone number. Object. Objection that states the facts and evidence. Okay. Then subsequent to that, he decides. Hold on, Mr. Pryor. When there's an objection, I'm going to rule on it before you launch into another question. So the objection is sustained. Subsequent to that, he decides to give you the phone number. Is that right? Can you repeat the question, please? I'll go back over the, uh, the analysis here. Thank you. If your your testimony is that Mr. Dave Bell refused to give you the phone number at first, correct? That's correct. And he and that was an adamant refusal. He said, "No, I don't know uh, what her phone number is." Right? That's correct. And then, without any further prompting by the police officers or any encouragement by law enforcement, he shows back up and gives you the phone number later. Right? Objection. He's misstating the facts of the well, evidence. I'm trying to establish the facts, Judge. The objection's overruled. If the witness has an answer, you may answer. You say he showed back up. He never left when I originally asked him. Okay. I had to ask him twice to get the phone number. Okay. And how much time passed between the first request and the second request? Roughly a minute. Okay. So without any prompting by the police, he... He, um, he asked him for the phone number, he denied, and then within 60 seconds, he said, oh, here's the phone number. Is that what your testimony is? When Detective Hope started walking towards us and I re-asked him again, that's when he gave me the number. So you had to ask him twice, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Now you, um, I'm going to kind of bounce around a little bit, okay? Please, please bear with me, okay? Um, you made a, a comment about supposed paintball guns, and then if I misquote your testimony, please correct me, okay? You said something about a supposed paintball gun incident with um, Tammy Daybell, right? Yes. And um, 
then you later on decided that it was a, the words you used were a shooting. Is that the word you used? Probably. Well, you were just here testifying a few minutes ago. I just used the word shooting when Mr. Wood talked to you about that, right? Um, yes. Okay. Now, as part of your investigation, um, you've had a chance to look at all the evidence, right? In this case? You got access to almost all the evidence in this case, right? That's right. And have you gone through all the evidence in this case? Yes, I have. Okay. And did you look um, at evidence of, uh, of facts and circumstances surrounding the Tammy Daybell incident on October 9th? Uh, yes. Okay. And Judge, just bear with me. Your Honor, if he's going to be showing that evidence digitally, we will put our screen back up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to be up there, but I'll help them. Now, I would uh, represent to you that um, we previously uh, stipulated to the admission of a number of exhibits in this case. And one of the exhibits is exhibit number 16. Okay? And the parties that previously exhibited, Judge, um, I'm going to, well, I've already, we've already looked at this already been exhibited. So, what, what I'm going to do is show you exhibit 16. Okay? And this is one already admitted. It's already been admitted, Judge, previously. Now, you talked about um, facts, and you used the word shooting is what you use, right? With Terry Daybell? Right. And you don't believe that uh, Tammy Daybell was shot at with anything other than a paintball gun, do you? Objection relevance. Or you don't believe that Tammy Daybell was shot with anything other than, shot with anything other than a paintball gun, do you? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, and what do you base that on? The evidence um, through our investigation. Okay, and part of your investigation is you uh, did you look at the Tammy Daybell uh, evidence that she provided to your office? To my office or Fremont County? Fremont County. I did. Okay, and one of the pieces of evidence is Exhibit Number Sixteen. Judge, I don't see it going up. All right, counsel, if you'd like, we can take a motion break or we can keep moving on here from there. Here we are, Judge. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and officer, I'd have you turn to the screen and see if you can read the screen. Just read it. Not out loud, just to yourself. Let me know when you're done. I'm done, sir. Okay. And I would represent to you that this is a uh, email from Tammy Daybell to her friends in the Salem Third Ward of her church. Okay. And would you would you start with the word something and read the email to me? Something really weird just happened. I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask suddenly standing at the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran around the back of the house. I have no idea what his motive was and he never spoke, even after I asked him several times what he, though. Okay. So, and do you see the date on this email? <clears throat> No. Just about friends there. Are you going to object to this being characterized as a email? I'll sustain that. Okay. You want to clarify, Mr. Carr, what type of communication it is? Well, it's a communication to the friends of the church, and I think it's a text. I'm sorry. I can. I believe. 
believe it's a text message. Judge, I may have just stated that it was an email. Okay. My apology. So this text message went out to all of the friends of the third Salem Third Ward. It's an LDS ward over in the town of Salem, right? I can't answer that. No, You know where the town of Salem is, right? I do. And that's a town that's uh, close to Rexburg? Correct. Okay. And obviously, the, you can't answer that about the ward or anything like that, but obviously the term ward would suggest that it's some sort of a religious <laughs> group of folks they're talking to, right? Correct. Okay. But this email doesn't say that she was shot with a gun, but there's even a mention of a gun. The email talks about a paintball. Again, I'm going to object to characterization, characterization of this as an email. He's going to say, Judge, it's going to be. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's be clear. Yeah. When there's an objection, Mr. Dryer, again, you've got to have time to get it on the record, make the ruling, and then respond to these. So, sustain the steps, the evidence. Text. <laughs> I'm also going to object to this being described as a text message. There needs to be some foundation for what this evidence actually is. Judge, I don't need a foundation. This has been admitted as an exhibit. This All is right. admitted. I'll overrule that objection. The jury can do it in the format it came in with uh, the screen capture. Okay. So, in any way, this message from this day to the people of the third ward doesn't say that it was a gun, does it? Mm -hmm. It says, does say it's a gun, it just says it's a paintball gun. Oh, it says it's a paintball gun. You're right. Okay. Yes, sir. It doesn't say any other gun, right? And if there's any confusion about that, right? Not in this email or text. Okay. Did you also have an occasion to look at the, um, well, you bring that up later, but the, uh, the search engine from Tammy Daybell's account? No, I did not look at the search engine for Tammy. Did you, were you aware that, uh, um, and I, I'm going to hack his name, but one of the officers, Officer K, he, he, whatever his name is, Officer K, was provided uh, email uh, search search information that Tammy Daniel engaged in um, regarding paintball guns in a picture. Are you aware of that? Uh, objection calls for speculation. I'm asking whether he's aware of it. Are you aware of it? I was aware that they were, he was provided information. I can't tell you exactly what information he was. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that in another day. But did you also listen to the 911 call that was made regarding the paintball incident? I did. Okay. And there was no mention of a gun in that 911 call, right? No. The, the mention in the 911 call is that someone took a shot at me or tried to take a shot with a paintball gun, right? That's correct. Okay. So the suggestion today that uh, um, it was a gun is based on your own hunch, right? No, sir. Well, do you have the gun? I have evidence of Google searches done by Alex Cox around right. that time. Okay. Do you have information as to where Alex Cox was at the time of this alleged shooting? Yes, sir. You do have evidence of that? He was at the Daybell residence earlier that day. I didn't ask you on the day of uh, the Daybell residence at the time of this shooting. Do you recall when this shooting took place? I believe it was maybe eight in the evening, maybe. Right. And 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 let's clarify this because the the data that you have regarding him being at the residence was much earlier in the day, right? That's correct. And he and and you don't have any data. That shows that Alex Cox's phone dinged or any other communication device that Alex Cox had was at the location of the house at the time of this paintball incident, do you? At the time, no, sir. Okay. And uh, so at this point, the information you're talking about is there's some Google searches by Alex Cox, correct? That's correct. And the information is that you've decided to um, not take into consideration Tammy Daniel's own statement about a paintball gun? Projection misstates his testimony. Sustain. So, what other information are you are you are you leaning on to suggest that this was anything but a paintball gun? The Google searches performed by Alex Cox talked about shooting through uh, Dodge Dakota. Okay, and I I appreciate that, and and um, that would be one of Chad and, and Tammy Daybell's vehicles. Is that correct? That's correct. 
Okay, were you aware of who was driving the Dodge Dakota at the time that incident took place? No, sir. Okay. Uh, did you talk to any of the family members, any of the four children about who was actually the driver of this Dodge Dakota that was that Alex Cox was trying to figure out a way to shoot through? We attempted to contact those children and they wouldn't speak with us. Okay. Okay, so you don't know whether Chad Daybell or Tammy Daybell were driving that Dodge Dakota, right? That's correct. So the reality is that um, Tammy Daybell was driving the Dodge Dakota. It sounds like Alex Cox had something for Tammy Daybell. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting that. I'm just simply stating what Mr. Cox's Google searches were around the time of that shooting. Okay, and you're basing those those Google searches on your position that you believe this was a shooting, right? That's correct. Okay, so if Chad Daybell was driving the Dodge Dakota during this time, and he was the primary driver and maybe the only driver, would that mean then you would be looking at whether Alex Cox was trying to shoot Chad Daybell? Chad Daybell didn't call in a 911 call and said he was shot at Tammy Daybell. Yeah, but Tammy Daybell called in a 911 call about a paintball gun. And it was a paintball gun. And we'll have Officer uh, 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 Cannon talk about that. And we'll listen to the 911 call. As Jackson, actually, that's not a question. Well, the question is, Mr. Pryor, again, you've got to give me an opportunity to roll an objection that is sustained. It's just argument, it's not a question. You can ask another question. The shooting and the call that was taking place was in reference to a paintball gun incident, wasn't it? Can you repeat the question, sir? I couldn't hear you. The call that was made regarding this incident was a 911 call about a paintball incident, wasn't it? They used the words paintball in the 911 call. That's correct. We'll move on. Okay. Now, we previously talked about, and Judge, I don't know whether you want to stop. I've got a ways to go. I, I think this probably is a good time for the lunch break, even though I'm. So we will take our lunch uh, recess. That will be an hour. We'll plan on coming back on for additional testimony around nine and a quarter after one. All rise, please.
Mr. Pryor, are you ready to continue with your cross examination? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll go ahead and have the jurors brought in. Mr. Sure. Chuck, would you prefer to wait? It's up to you. You can go take the podium if you'd like, or you can wait at Chelsea State Law. All right, please. <laughs> Uh, the jury is present in council. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we are back on the record on case CR 2221-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Davo. The defense is conducting cross examination of the witness, Detective Hermosillo. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to continue, you may. Okay. Officer Hermosillo, I'm going to take my time. I probably need too much coffee this morning, so I already had a little lunch hour, and now I think I'm okay. Let's hope so. On that. I think the uh, judge has admonished me enough at this point that I think I got the point. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go a little slower, if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to go back to the paintball incident. And you said that uh, one of the pieces of evidence was that Alex Cox had Googled a uh, black uh, Dodge Dakota, correct? He Googled what caliber it would take to shoot through the windshield of Dodge Dakota. Was it the windshield? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, Judge, there's previously been an admission of um, Exhibit 34 by stipulation. That's the Homer J. Maximus you know, reference to the state as well. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But um, so uh, there was at least a reference at some point that there was going to be a trying to find out what kind of caliber it would take to penetrate uh, a Dodge Dakota vehicle, somewhat windshield or otherwise, correct? Correct. And you took that as a threat, uh, um, as a means of saying that's why uh, Alex Cox was trying to kill Tammy Davo. That Google search along with him being at that residence that same day earlier. Okay. And the incident involving Tammy Daybell. Okay. Okay. That, okay. And those that's what drew you to that conclusion. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So we don't know who was driving the Dodge Dakota regularly, do we? Because you didn't speak with the kids. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And we do know that on the day that you said Chad Daybell, at least you were alleging that Chad Daybell fled on sometime in June, by June, June 9th. Is that Object, right? Objection in the states, the testimony. Well, try to clarify that. High rate of speed, uh, Chad Daybell left the, the area. Is that fair? That's fair. That's what you're stating, correct? 
That's right. And in the vehicle that he was in, do you know that that was the Dodge Dakota that supposedly he was fleeing in? It was not Dodge Dakota he was fleeing in. Okay, what vehicle was he fleeing in? Uh, I can't recall off the top of my head. We have it in inbound, but it wasn't the Dodge Dakota. Okay. Okay. So there were two vehicles, an Equinox and a Dodge Dakota. Which, so day, which on, day, sir? On June 9th. Which there are two vehicles that Dave also owned, an Equinox and the Dodge Dakota. So which one was it that he was allegedly fleeing? I just did. I couldn't recall the vehicle that okay. he was arrested. Okay. okay. That's that's fair. That's fair. So um, just to recap, we know that there was a Google search by Alex Cox on his Homer J. Maximus account, correct? Correct. And that there was an allegation that someone was, or that Ms. Alex Cox was trying to figure out what type of caliber to at least shoot at a, uh, uh, a black Dodge Dakota, correct? Correct. Okay. We don't know who the target was, uh, or who was the target was in that Dodge Dakota, but we know it was someone who owned the vehicle, obviously, right? Well, I would assume so. Okay, okay. Now, that's what you based on the fact that you thought that there was an attempt on um, Tammy Daybell that, that day, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, uh, did, when you read that email from the Homer J, or the search from the Homer J Maximus account, did you take into consideration the date of when that search took place? Uh, I did. And when was that? I can't recall. I have to refer to my notes. Okay. I'm going to um, take the liberty of helping you out a little bit. At least I think I would help you. Judge, I don't know why it's not going up on the screen. Is this a exhibit? 34. 34 sorry. Which 34 has sub exhibits? Is I believe it's A, Judge. 34A is admitted previously by stipulation. 34A is what you're trying to publish, Mr. Clark? Yes, Judge. Uh, I don't know if there's some. One can assist to see you, but the okay, it is in the middle. There we go. I'm sorry, and I don't know why. Well, we were just made plans to prepare for this. So, I'd like you to take a look up at the screen if you would. Um, look at the date of when uh, this uh, uh, search took place. Okay. And what is that date? October 12th of 2019. Okay, now what was the date that allegedly Tammy Daybell was shot at with a paintball gun? October 9th, 2019. So, if I understand, the, the incident with the paintball gun took place three days before the search took place. Correct. Okay. But you still continue to believe that was the basis for someone going after um, Tammy Daybell, is that right? That's correct. Okay, all right. But you don't have any Google searches that suggest anything else in a threatening manner. This is the one and only that you're relying on. Is that right? No, that's not right. All right. What else are you relying on? 
If you scroll up on October 9th, I believe that evening. Okay. Go ahead. Alex Cox Googles. How to make an AR-15 function in cold weather. Okay. Um, there's some other Googles if you'd like to pull up. Well, I've got those and we're going to go through those. And we'll have an opportunity to do that, but... And that was and that was the night Tammy was shot at. Okay. And he and he Googled that night, right? That's correct. What time at night was that? Do you recall? I have to look at my notes. Okay. Okay, but he also had a habit of Googling a lot of things, right? I can't answer that. Well, you talk you you know about the head of elector thing, right? No, sir. Oh, okay. Well, before we get to the head of electric thing, let's talk a little bit about some of the other searches from Homer J. Maximus. October 21. Best tactical cutting moves, right? Correct. See that one? All right, mm -hmm. Mr. Pryor, you are going to have to stay by that microphone or we don't pick up what it's said. Okay, Judge. October 22nd, 2019. Sharpening swords. Knife sharpener, right? Correct. Okay, what was the date of um, Tammy Daybell's death? October 19th, 2019. Okay, so three days after Tammy Daybell dies, Alex Cox is still looking at sharpening swords and a block knife sharpener three days after Tammy Daybell's death. Is that right? Correct. Okay. October 23rd, 4 days after Tammy Daybell's died, 15 facts about the silence and the lambs you didn't know. Recall that one? No, sir. Okay. And that was three, four days after Tammy dies, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, when you searched, um, and I, I believe it was um, 107, was that the unit that we found all of the knives and the guns? No, sir, that was 175. Okay, 175. That was Lori Vallow's unit then, right? That was the unit that Lori Vallow lived in, but Alex Cox was on the uh, tenant agreement. Okay, okay. And... Your testimony previously, I believe that was a day or so ago, it was there were a significant number of uh, weapons found, right? That's correct. Right. Did you do a check on all of those weapons to see who they belonged to? I personally did not do a check on all of those weapons. What about the knives or the ammunition? Did you check and see who those belonged to? I'm not quite sure how to check on who the knives I don't belonged either. to. I don't either. I just asked because I... So... Um, are you presuming that the owner of those knives and guns and ammunition is Alex Cox? They were found amongst his belongings, so oh, I do like this. And we talked about this before um, when I was doing some voir dire and native objection uh, that a lot of those items were items, the knives and the, the ammunition were items that you pulled out of bags and displayed for purposes of, of um, for lack of a better word, staging them for your photo op, right? That's correct. Okay, okay. But again, the, all of the ammunition, all of the weapons, all of the knives, and the, the, the ski mask, that was uh, found in Alex Cox's, uh, at or near Alex Cox's belongings, right? Correct. 
Correct. So you're, I don't want you to speculate, but you're presuming that Alex Cox owned all of those, right? That's correct. There's no indication that the, that Lori Vallow had several guns and knives and mm -hmm. things like that. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. <clears throat> I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Charles Vallow. Okay? okay. And I assume you've been communicating with the folks down in Arizona about all of that. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, so you're well versed in the facts as it relates to Charles Vallow, correct? Uh, no, I wouldn't say well versed. I know the basics. Okay, but are part of the basics to know uh, where the court proceedings are and who was charged with what? Um, you would have to be more specific. Okay, and, and do you know currently who's charged in the death of Charles Vallow? Uh, yes. Okay, who is that? Lori Mellon. Okay. Are, are you are you aware that the prosecuting attorney down in Maricopa County issued a objection here saying that's the same. Judge, I'm asking him whether he's aware, not whether he well, by the time you say what he's aware of, then all the information is coming through his yeah. so it's sustainable. Okay. Are you aware that Chad Daybell is not charged with anything in Maricopa County relating to Charles Mallow? Yes, I am. Brandon Boudreaux's next. Who's been charged in the allegations against Brandon Boudreaux? Lori Bellum. Is there anybody else? Not that I'm aware. Okay, and you're also aware that, Char that Chad Daybell has not been charged in the allegations as they relate to Brandon Boudreaux, is that right? That's right. Okay, now if Alex Cox was still alive, uh, there's the suggestion seems to be that he would have been charged with uh, both of those offenses. Would that be fair? Jackson calls for speculation. Okay. Do you do you have any information as to who killed Charles Vallow? Uh, yes. Who do you believe killed Charles Vallow? Alex Cox. Okay. Who do you believe took the shot at Brandon Boudreaux? Alex Cox. Okay. Thank you. Now, did you have the occasion? to um, look into the history of Alex Cox a little bit? Briefly. Okay, were you aware of an incident that occurred in, um, let me get the date right, August 5th of 2007? You'd have to be more specific about what occurred on that date, sir. On that date, uh, there was an allegation that uh, there was an assault on a um, Joseph Ryan. That's correct. You're familiar. You're familiar with that, is that right? Yes. And in 2007, is there any indication that Chad Daybell knew Lori Vallow in 2007? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And in that incident, are you aware that uh, Alex Cox committed aggravated assault on Joseph Ryan? Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object to relevance. I think we're outside the scope of what's happening in this case, Mr. Pryor. Judge, can I approach, please, with counsel? Sure. I'm outside Washington.
Judge Hart, but I just wanted to reiterate, we had a, an objection that was sustained on relevance grounds and the court uh, confirms that objection, uh, including under 403, it's not relevant for purposes of this case. Judge, based on that ruling, the state would move to strike the question. All right, the question is strict on that topic won't be uh, allowed. I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, Chad Daybell's phone unit. I'd like you to refresh my recollection. Okay. Yeah. You made mention that on the 26th, when you were uh, doing the initial uh, welfare check, you followed up with calls to uh, Mr. Daybell. Is that right? That's right. And your testimony was that. Um, you weren't able to get an answer or the phone was turned off? Every time we called, it went straight to voicemail, I believe. Oh, all right. Um, did you have an opportunity to read, go through Mr. Daybell's phone records? I personally have not, no. So there's no indication that the phone was ever turned off, was there? I can't testify that I didn't go through these records. Right. But you can testify that it just went to voicemail. Correct. I can testify he didn't answer. Okay. Now, when you searched Lori Vallow's residence, uh, there weren't any clothes in there. In the residence that she had hanging up with hangers, right? That's correct. Do you have any information to suggest that she had mailed or shipped her clothes to another location? No, I don't. Okay. And then you... Uh, um, at the time, you were aware that Mr. Daybell obviously was, was married to Ms. Ms. Fallow at that point. Is that correct? That's correct. And is it your allegation that Mr. Daybell left on the 26th or 27th and also tried to avoid uh, contact with law enforcement? I can't answer why Mr. Daybell left. All I can answer to you is I wasn't able to get a hold of him after that date. Okay. And after that date, did you happen to check credit cards or phone records or anything like that to try to locate him? Again, sir, I didn't go through Mr. Daybell's phone records. Okay. Did you did you gain any information that Mr. Daybell was going on a vacation around the 26th or 27th of that the end of the month? We later learned uh, that Mr. Daybell was in California. Okay. And later learned that he was in California, and that was about the time of the 28th or 29th of November. Is that right? I'd have to refer to my notes. Okay. And were you aware of right. that? And again, I, maybe the coffee's still affecting me. I'll try to slow down, okay? I'm sorry. Uh, but you're also aware that Mr. Daybell on the 28th being at Knott's Berry Farms, right? Correct. And that was a family vacation with his kids, correct? Uh, I, I can't testify to who was there. Okay, so Mr. Daybell wasn't fleeing. He was on the 26th or 27th of the month when uh, Maury Vallow's closet was empty. Mr. Daybell was on a family vacation. I can't testify that he wasn't fleeing. I can testify that I knew he was in California at a later date. Okay. And you know that later date was the end of November, right? Close to that date, sir, yes. Okay. And you know that subsequent to that, then he went on a trip to uh, Hawaii after that, right? Yes, he was in Hawaii after that. Right. So it, if, if I understand the testimony, Mr. Daybell was uh, at some point after the 26th, went on a planned family vacation at Knox Ferry Farms, right? Uh, I can't testify it was a planned family vacation. Okay, so. all right, that's okay. And then subsequent to that, he then went to Hawaii on a trip to Hawaii where there was some contact with you folks, correct? Uh, yeah, we made contact with Mr. Daybell in Hawaii. Okay, and how is it that you found that out that he was in Hawaii again, remind me? Please. Through tips that came in through uh, our hotlines that we had set up. And cell phone data. Did, and, and this is just a question. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Did maybe you just look at uh, plane records? Are you asking? Yeah, I'm asking. Did you guys look at? I can't. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Can you repeat the question, please? Did you just? Did at any time did you just take the initiative to look at plane records? So each officer was tasked with different things. Okay. Uh, we did have an officer that looked through finance 
financial, okay. and I assume he did look through plan records and credit cards. Okay. And uh, Mr. Dave was flying on a commercial plane or traveling from Boise to uh, Knott's Berry Farm on a commercial plane. In your experience and knowledge of these things, there would have been a record of that, right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to switch gears again a little bit, okay? Please, please forgive me because uh, I just want to make sure I hit all of these subjects. And, and before we go there, I want to make sure you did get a subpoena from my office. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've acknowledged that you've accepted that, correct? Correct. And you were kind enough to contact my office and agree that if I need you to come back, you'll you'll come back in a time of the suitable for both of us. Is that fair? Yes. Was there anything else discussed during that phone conversation? Dave said I couldn't make it back. Okay, and that was because and we're not going to get into this on, on to let everybody know because it's nobody else's business. But you have an obligation of some sort, and and I've acknowledged that, and we're going to work on that. Is that fair? Objection relevance. Sustained. Okay. Now, um, as part of your investigation, and I want to be specific to J.J. Ballow, okay? Um, the last known sign of life was the 22nd, is that fair? The last, the last time the that they someone died was September 22nd of 2019. Right, okay. And the last, um, at least proof of, of life for um, Tylee Ryan was September 8th. 2019. 2019. So I'll do the math in my head if I can. There's 15 days difference between Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Is that correct? For the last, last proof of, uh, of living or life. Respect. Rough, yeah, roughly 15 days. You, you think JJ um, died on around the 9th of September, 8th or 9th of September, and Tylee was the 22nd or 23rd. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, thank you. Now, as part of the um, investigation, uh, you looked into um, where JJ Vallow was on the 22nd of September, correct? Correct. And on the evening of the 22nd of September, he was at Lori Vallow's home. That's correct. Okay. And present at that home, staying in that home, were uh, Lori Vallow, correct? Correct. Uh, at least on the 22nd, J.J. Vallow was there, correct? That's correct. Melanie Gibb was there, correct? Correct. And David Warwick was there. Correct. Okay. And on that evening, there were they were conducting some sort of a religious podcast, the three of them, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, the allegation is that JJ was acting up and went into the pair of um, of um, Alex Cox. Correct. And then Alex took JJ into a separate apartment, correct? On on which day? On the twenty second. He took him to apartment one zero seven. Right. His apartment or whoever was on the lease for that apartment, right? That's right. Okay. And then the last time that anybody saw JJ um, was later that evening. Is that fair? Yes. And that was when Alex Cox was carrying JJ Vallow into the apartment of Lori, David, and Melanie Gibb, right? That's correct. We were all staying there together, correct? That's correct. And then somewhere at that point, whether it was at that point or subsequent to that evening, or that evening, um, that's when you believe that uh, J.J. Vallow was murdered. That's correct. Okay. But the next morning, um, the next morning, uh, there were three people in the apartment at, at that time early in the morning, correct? Jackson Foundation. Well, do you know who was in the apartment early that morning on the 23rd? Hold on, prior. There's an objection. I think that we are sustained. Do you have any knowledge of who was in the apartment on the 23rd of September, the morning of that morning of 2019? Yes. And who was there? 
David Warwick, Melanie Gibb, and Maury Vallow. Okay. And at that point, you believe that um, J.J. Vallow was already dead? I can't testify to the time, but I believe he was killed. Okay. But then within two hours later from that morning, you believe that he was buried on Chad Daybell's property. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, you had an occasion to talk with Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> now, you did it a couple of times, if I recall. One by phone, right? With Melanie Gibb? Correct. And that wasn't recorded, was it? Uh, it was recorded. It was recorded? With her attorney? No. No, I'm talking about a regular phone call with Melanie Gibb, without an attorney. Uh, I don't remember a phone call. Okay. All right. We're going to revisit that maybe at another date, but uh, that's fine. But you also went down to um, uh, Provo, Utah. And I'm, I'm going off of memory, but it was Provo, Utah on the 4th of June of 2020. Is that right? Sure. Now, at that point, um, you were interviewing both David Warwick and Melanie Gibb about information they had about this these allegations, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, who, was El who else was there? Uh, myself, Lieutenant Ball, uh, and Prosecutor Wood. Okay, so the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Wood, right there, and um, a lieutenant that you work with and yourself drove down to Provo, Utah. Correct. And was there anybody from any local law enforcement there as well? No. Okay, now there was an effort to um, record that conversation, is that right? Yes, it was recorded. Okay, was the entire thing recorded? Uh, I believe the very beginning wasn't. The, the uh, recorder malfunctioned or something happened that was recorded, but the majority of that interview was recorded. The majority of them. That's correct. So if I represent to you that uh, there was uh, 22 minutes of recording on that interview, does that sound about the length of what the interview was with Melanie Gibb? No. It doesn't? No. Okay. Um, would it be helpful if you were able to listen to that recording and view that recording to refresh your recollection? Refresh my recollection. Like about the length of time that recording was? It should have been longer than 22 minutes. Oh, yeah. there longer than 22 minutes. How long were you there? Uh, roughly, say about an hour maybe. Okay. Now, your, your testimony is that it should have been longer than 21 or 22 minutes. Is that right? That's correct. Would it surprise you to learn that, uh, well, you don't know exactly how long that interview took place, though, right? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the exact time. And you don't know the length of the recording itself. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, and in order to determine that, it would be helpful for you to refresh your recollection by listening to the interview, and it would be able to answer those questions for you. Is that fair? That's fair. Your Honor, I'm going to get beyond the scope. We're way beyond the scope of your your red counsel. If also the officer is going to do that, and I permit it, of course, it's not going to be in the presence of the jury. Uh, so I'll sustain the objection on the on the scope. Judge, are you talking about the on the scope of direct examination? Yes. Okay, then officer, we'll revisit that at another time, okay? And we'll leave that for another opportunity um, when I call you back. Now, um, on the day that um, J.J. Vallow was found in June 9th, on June 9th, okay? Your, your, the pictures and the testimony you showed suggested that he was wearing um, 
the grit, the gems, and some Skecher socks. Is that right? Sure. Okay. Do you have a recollection of what J.J. Ballow was wearing based on your investigation when he was carried by Alex Cox from uh, Alex Cox's apartment to the upstairs of, upstairs of Lori Ballow's apartment? Objection. This calls for hearsay. It doesn't necessarily call for hearsay. He's wondering what he observed him wearing, if you know. So yes, that's how we go on that. Yeah. Tell me if you know the answer. To that. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. okay. Do you know whether or not JJ Fallow was wearing red pajamas when he was carried upstairs by Alex Cox? Sir, I don't know the answer to okay. that question. Okay. And Judge, I think at this point, um, I'm going to save the rest of my questioning for uh, when I call the officer back in my case in chief. That's okay. Very well. You can do that. I'll conclude the cross examination then. Uh, this time we'll begin with redirect from the state. Mr. Wood. Your Honor, may I be handed States Exhibit 31? <laughs> yes, and States Exhibit 30. Detective, you testified earlier about when you first met Alex or Chad Dano. Correct. Who was he with? Alex Cox. Did he look afraid of Alex Cox? Uh, no. Okay. Alex Cox was Chad Dano's brother in law, correct? When you met him? That's correct. So if you were you were asked about your beliefs, is that is that fair in in cross examination? You were asked about your beliefs. Yes. Let's talk about your investigation. When you started your investigation, what was the scope of your investigation? Initially, it was to find um, the Jeep from Gilbert, Arizona. And then it expanded, correct? That's correct. And then what was the scope of your investigation? To find the whereabouts of JJ and Tylee. And all this time you're collecting information from various sources. That's correct. Your Honor, may I publish State's Exhibit 31? Yes. That did you again you were you were asked about your beliefs, correct? That's correct. And you were asked about your beliefs regarding I'm gonna call it the paintball incident, is that fair? Yes. And when I'm talking about that, what what do you to your understanding, what am I referring to? Do you the shooting of Timmy Demo. And you testified you don't believe it was a paintball gun. That's correct. So why not? Through our investigation, we learned that Alex Cox was in the area and on the property of Chad Daybell the morning that Tammy Daybell was shot at October 9th. Through Google searches from Homer J. Maximus, which was Alex's Google account, the night that Tammy Daybell was shot, 
it was a cold evening. And the Google searches were uh, how to make an AR-15 function in the cold weather. And without referring to my notes, I can I refer to my notes? Would it refresh your memory <clears throat> to review your notes? Yes, sir. Your Honor, may the, may the witness look at his report. No objection. Yes, you can look at it, uh, not to testify yeah. from to refresh your recollections. So once you look at that, it's now. On October 8th, the night before uh, we believe Tammy was shot at, Alex is Googling drop yardage from 300 yards to 100 yards, um, which we assumed uh, when you're shooting a rifle, you're, you're adjusting your sights to your target. That was the night before. The morning of the shooting, Alex was on Mr. Davell's property. Um, we have him driving up and down the road of Mr. Davell's property and also on the property. Later that evening into the early morning hours of October 10th is when he Googled how to make your AR-15 function in cold weather. Um, so that's why we believe that it wasn't just a paintball gun. We believe that Alex Cox was, was there to shoot Tammy Devo. Okay. And I'm going to have you look at this timeline. And as far as you're aware, these, these dates are accurate, correct? I'm sorry. As far as you're aware, these, these in pursuit to your investigation, these dates are accurate, correct? It's correct. Did the fact that Tammy Dayville died 10 days after that incident have any bearing on whether or not you believed it was a paintball gun? Yes. Did the fact that uh, Chad Dayville got married 17 days later have any bearing on your belief whether or not it was a paintball gun? Yes. The fact that there were two children buried on Chad Dayville's property have any bearing on whether or not you believed it was a paintball gun? Yes. Did the fact that Lori had, well, did the fact that Lori Vallow's husband died within months of these other deaths have any bearing on your belief of whether or not it was a paintball gun? Absolutely. And finally, did the fact that uh, Brandon Boudreaux was shot at on October 2nd, 2019, have any bearing on your belief of whether or not it was a paintball gun? Yes. And it's your belief that Alex Cox was tied to these events, correct? That's correct. Okay. And because you were asked about your beliefs, was it your belief that Chad Daybell was tied to these events? Yes. Why? Based in, on our investigation, the, the, the lies that we've been told the fact that uh, we tried to get a hold of the kids' mother, Lori Vallow, 
kid's stepfather, Chad Daybell, um, their uncle, Alex Cox. We weren't able to get a hold of anybody who were um, left in the dark. Based on all those events, that's what our beliefs were as a collectively. Pursuant to your investigation, you know when Alex Cox died? December 12th, 2019. At any time after Alex Cox died, did Mr. Daybell call the Rexburg police to report that there might be dead children located on his property? No, he didn't. Did he call the Rexburg police with any concerns that perhaps his wife had been harmed by someone? No, he didn't. Did he call the Rexburg police before Alex Cox died to say he might be in danger? Judge, we're going beyond the scope, but if you want me to, I would ask that I'd be an opportunity to uh, revisit those issues. I'm, I'm going to uh, sustain that objection. So okay. That's the word. Again, so the first time you met Chad Daybell, what was the first thing you asked her? When you had an opportunity to speak to the to the answer. This is response to the cross, your yeah. overall. I asked him when the last time he saw uh, JJ Bella was. And what did he answer? In October, in apartment 107 with Lori Bella. And did you ask for Lori Bella's phone number? I did. And what was his first response? Judge, this has been asked to answer. It's in response to the cross. Overall. His response was he didn't know her cell phone number. Detective, you were asked a little bit about how you do an investigation. Correct? Correct. And we spoke about the scope of your investigation in this case. Correct. It was your testimony that you followed where the evidence took you in this case. That's correct. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Judge, there were some issues that were opened up. I'd like to have the opportunity to meet the witness. There were a few, so I'll allow a limited recross, particularly considering your statement that you're going to recall the witness. So we will be limited, if you'd like to, Mr. Pryor, you may. Detective, there was some testimony about um, not with your teacher, but your teacher. Thank you. There was some testimony that you uh, uh, had the whereabouts of Alex Cox on the property of Chad Daybill, and that would have been on the 9th? That's correct. Of October. Yes. Do you have a recollection of how long he was there on that property? I don't. Okay, and you're basing that knowledge on his phone records and his pings, right? Correct. Did you have an occasion to look at all of Alex Cox's whereabouts on that day by way of his phone records, or did you just look at that specific time? We were more interested in that specific time. Okay, and, and you, I, I gather from your testimony that you didn't look at between 8 and 10 o'clock on the 9th when the paintball incident took place. You, you didn't look at that time for Alex Cox's whereabouts, did you? If I remember right, I didn't get his location uh, near the property at that time. There was no location. Okay. And uh, isn't it true, officer, that you didn't get his location at that time because Alex Cox's phone was pinging in Idaho Falls at that time, some several miles away? I can't testify to that. Okay, okay. But you know he wasn't on the property by way of his phone ping and, and all of the metadata. That's the word you used, right? Metadata? Right. By the metadata, Alex Cox wasn't on the Daybell property when Tammy Daybell was shot at with a paintball gun, correct? No, sir. I can't answer that. I can answer that 
Alex Cox's cell phone or his device was not on the property. Okay, and you can also uh, say that his device was on Chad Nagel's property uh, sometime in the morning of the, uh, the 9th of October, right? And driving down the roadway in front of the property. Right. Sure. And we don't know who else was on the property on the 9th of October, do we? I can't testify to who was on the property. Right. So we don't know if he was there by himself or is he there with other folks, correct? That's correct. Okay. And when we're talking about um, the, you've been on the pro the Dayball property, right? A couple right. of times. Yes. And you took a photo of the, the car and we're going to revisit that next time we get together. But um, um, it's not a hundred yards from the end of the Daybell driveway to the road, is it? No, sir. Do you have an idea of how how long that driveway is? Could you could you give me an idea if you know if you know? I I couldn't testify to that. Is it fifty yards? No, I would say maybe thirty, maybe thirty yards. Twenty thirty yards. Yeah. So sixty to ninety feet. That's my rough guess, yes. Okay, so if we're looking at a rifle at 300 yards and dropping it down to 100 yards, we don't need 100 yards to get from one end of the Daybell driveway to the other, do we? What our investigation or our um, belief was, if you're asking me what my belief is? No, I'm asking you the distance down the end of the Daybell driveway to the top of the Daybell driveway. Is it, That's not 100 yards, right? Well, that's correct. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. All right. All right. Mr. Wood is the state of the call to witness. Your Honor, can we approach you? Yeah. Your Honor, may this witness leave the stand? Oh, I didn't know where that we are. Do you want to decide our first? No, we're not. We're, we're okay. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Sia, you may go ahead and return down. And because you are still under subpoena, may we recall, I will admonish you to uh, abide by the court's exclusionary rule. You're not permitted to review or view testimony at the trial between now and the time you return to your testimony. If you fail to follow that and follow the trial or observe any testimony, you will not be permitted to testify again. All right. Okay, thank you.
All right, Council, if you'll give me a moment, I want to clarify our record on exhibits admitted through that last witness to make sure the court has a clear record of what came in as it relates to exhibit 34. So we did have a stipulation that on the record here and for the jurors to know as well, we had, uh, I believe 34 had separate attachments or it would be separate exhibits, 34A, B, C, D, and E. Is that what 34 consists of? Yes, Judge, and the state had stipulated to the admission all of uh, 34, which included those separate exhibits. They already had stipulated to Okay, and understanding they were stipulated to, but still on the record, I'm going to make clear that exhibits 34A, 34B, 34C, 34D, and 34E have all been admitted into the record and our evidence in case the state concur with that. That sounds accurate, Your Honor. Okay. Council, yeah, so when we conclude, I'll have you stick around for a minute to also see if we need further clarify if it's on the record. Uh, at this time, ladies and gentlemen of the jury and those in attendance, I've discussed scheduling here with counsel. Uh, we got this trial started and moving along with jury selection a little quicker than anticipated, and the state is at its stage of putting on its case in chief. They're doing their best to line up witnesses to appear here coming a little sooner than anticipated, and that's the explanation. We are going to go ahead and conclude for today in order to allow the state to have a full day's worth of evidence and testimony beginning on Monday. And then next week, we should be on a full slate of Monday through Friday trial. Uh, notice also, as I mentioned previously, that tomorrow uh, is not gonna be a day of trial. So as I understand it, the state would request that we then include trial for the week and commence again on Monday morning. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Sure. The state has been, or I'm sorry, does the defense have any objection to that? No objection, Judge Dick. Okay. So before you leave, then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is a pretty long break in between uh, evidence now that you are sworn jurors in the case. And I will again admonish you to please do everything you can to not do anything to learn about the case, investigate the case, look the case up, follow any media in the case. Uh, if you do see anything being reported, try to avoid that. Don't talk about the case to anyone else or any of the evidence or facts with anyone, including with each other. You can only do that when you start your deliberations. And when you return on Monday morning, when we'll commence at 8.30 with more evidence, I will be asking the jurors as they return to complete those admonitions and certify under uh, penalty of perjury that you have followed that instruction. So. I appreciate you doing that so far. I have confidence you will continue to do that. And thank you for your time and efforts today. That will conclude our trial for today, and we will resume again on Monday with further evidence. All rise, please. Thank you. Please be seated. The matter on the Exhibit 34 is the court is referencing the, um, the defense trial exhibits. And 34 is listed. It says 34A through E, Alex Cox Google searches in October 2019. There's also a 34F and a 34G through J, and a 34K through Y. So I just wanted to make clear what came in the record today that will be admitted. We have 34 
A through E. That's correct. The other ones are yet to come. Okay. So, and I'm sorry it was confusing. I tried to do this as plainly as possible and have it all on a thumb drive so that the court can make it easier for the jury. But uh, at this point, it's only A through E. The others have been admitted, Judge. I just haven't referenced them yet. Okay, and just to be clear, even though admitted or, and, and agreed to to be admitted by stipulation, for this record to be accurate and for future reference of the record, each time a new exhibit is referenced, uh, it needs to be just called out on the record so the clerk keeps an accurate list of what exhibits have come in and that those track with the actual exhibits. So uh, I think the system works. We just need to make sure that uh, individually, for example, with that, if there's multiple exhibits within a number, then we outline exactly what came in. That way we make sure the jury doesn't see any evidence they weren't supposed to see and they see all the evidence they are supposed to see. So we'll continue to work on that process as we start next week. Uh, before we conclude today, then, is there anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone in attendance today also for following the court's conduct orders. I appreciate it very much. And we'll be in recess for the day. All rise, please. Guess what I just did? I downloaded the new Grocery Outlet app on my phone. Let me tell you, it's like having my own miniature neighborhood grocery outlet right by my side. I can see what's 